Hello, I'm John Allure. Before you listen to this episode, a couple of things. These are podcasts from the first season of Who Killed Teresa? They haven't been heard in over four years. They're raw. It took me a while to develop a style. A lot of people like them that way, unvarnished. Others commented that it was amateurish. Nonetheless, here they are, unedited. I haven't gone back and listened to them. I haven't cleaned them up. Thanks for listening. And once again, life isn't fair. Justice is blind and dysfunctional. And some cops aren't smart and dedicated like on television. This is Who Killed Teresa. Hi, welcome to the podcast. This is Who Killed Teresa. It's an investigation into a series of murders in the Quebec uh, Eastern Township regions and the Montreal region. Um, That uh, series of unsolved uh, cold cases that occurred uh, in the 1970s, early uh, 1980s. I'm the host. Uh, My name is John Allure. I'm the brother of Teresa Allure. And this is a podcast where life isn't fair, justice is blind and dysfunctional, and some cops aren't smart and dedicated like they are on television. So it's probably time for me to to say a little bit about who I am and uh, I guess my (laughs) my credentials for even discussing this. Um, How did I learn all this? Um, As much as I as I don't really like talking about myself, I realize that um, people might want some background as to why I got access to so much um, information, why I clearly had information um, that the police never had. Um, so uh, let's start by going into a little bit about that. And what I, I want to read to you um, a, 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 in the early days of blogging, uh, 2000s, I wrote a piece called Bad Dream House, and I'd like to read it to you. I think it will explain a lot. When my wife and I first moved to North Carolina, we were quite restless to put down some roots. We had spent a great deal of our married life living like gypsies, wandering from one city to the next. We moved to North Carolina in search of stability. Our daughter daughter was two at the time, and we had another child on the way. My wife had grown up in Chapel Hill. She still had all her family here. It was a good place to raise a family. We were tired of living in apartments. Two children needed a home. They needed a yard to play in. I was 37 years old. It was time to buy a house. My wife had her heart set on a fixer-upper just outside Chapel Hill. From the outside, the house was inviting. It looked like a two two A-frame stuck together a sort of Swiss chalet tucked neatly in the forest. As we approached the front door, my wife braced me with the words, you'll just have to go with me on this one. That's when I knew I was in trouble. We opened the door. The odor was the first thing that hit me. As I crossed the threshold, I caught a waft of, the dog's been pissing on the carpet for the last eight months. Then there were the visuals. The floor was absolutely covered with garbage. Think D-Day and Omaha Beach, only substitute dead bodies with old pizza boxes, hard packs of Marlboros, and crushed mellow yellow cans. Anything that could hold water was absolutely filled to the brim with cigarette butts. Whoever lived here was an artist. There were nude drawings covering all the walls. Cartoon anime, cinch waists and big tits, and a complimentary pornography collection in the video cabinet. There was a Christmas wreath hanging over the fireplace mantel. It was March 31st. There were weapons, nunchucks and broadswords and crossbows, a D&D nerd's dream come true. A thought crossed my mind. This must have been what it looked like when Guns N' Roses recorded their first album. Then I heard the music coming from down the hall. There's actually someone living here? We started down the hallway. The carpeting was gone, torn up by whatever animal had lived there. The subflooring was all that remained. For some reason, it was stained dark brown. 
I came to the door where the music was coming from. The door had about 50 knife marks in it. There were also silver dollar size holes. It looked like someone had shot at it. I opened the door. Black flag or anthrax or some crap was screaming from the stereo. On the bed rested a big, fat lump. The lump was sleeping. It was three in the afternoon. And this lump looked like it was comatose. Suddenly it rolled over, looked me briefly with one glazed fish eye, and passed out again. I closed the door. My wife and I were still arguing when we went to bed that night. To cut a long story short, against my better judgment, I decided to go with my wife on this one. We bought the house. Things only got worse. Before the closing, my wife was prone to coming out to the house alone. She would wander around the place and fantasize about all the little improvements we could make. A building inspector, an ex-Marine, advised my wife never to set foot alone in the house again. He had seen the lump in the bed. He thought he looked lethal. At the closing, none of our real estate people showed up. They found the house too disturbing. Eventually, we learned an elderly widow and her teenage son, the lump, had owned the house. We were told that the father had died and the mother wanted to move to a smaller accommodations that were more manageable. Junior was getting to be a handful, what with all the medieval arsenal and all. When we walked around the neighborhood, people would give us that funny look, you know, that you're the fools who bought that house. Ah, look. One neighbor eventually confided in us that the family had lived in the house for 20 years. The son was a quiet boy, but troubled. At age eight, he walked up to his neighbor's daughter on the street, smiled sweetly, and proceeded to pummel her with a brick he had concealed in his hand. It's not like we didn't know what we were getting ourselves into. The evidence was tattooed all over the house. These folks were troubled. There were knife marks everywhere, not only throughout the bedroom, but on kitchen walls, on the bathroom ceiling tile. There were so many stab marks on the wood floor in the living room, you'd have thought the Christmas dinner had been carved there. But our feeling was, don't blame the house for the way it looked. It wasn't the house's fault. All it needed was a little love and several dozen trips to the Home Depot. Fix what was broken became my spring project. I ripped up the kitchen, tore out the piss-stained carpet, replaced all the brown-stained subflooring. I threw out drywall, retiled the bathroom floors, pulled out horrendous amounts of hair and body gunk from drains. Finally, I decided it would be easier to simply gut the bathrooms altogether. When I'd go outside to work on the landscaping, my wife would quip, tell me if you find any dead bodies out there. I, of course, thought this was hysterical. A corpse would make our home complete. After six weeks, we finished our renovation. We burnt some sage given to us by our real estate agent, placed a small quartz crystal in the southwest corner of each room, because our real estate agent told us this would help with the bad vibes, and moved in. Of course, it came as no surprise whatsoever when four weeks later the police phoned us and asked if they could pay us a visit. It turned out that the son of the former owner of the house was the lead suspect in a missing persons investigation, and the police wished to check the property for a dead body. There are times when you realize life is trying to tell you something. This was one of those times. It would be fair to say that I have been a restless soul. I've traveled around a bit. Fifteen years ago, I left Canada and eventually became an American citizen. I'd like to say that I did this because I love America, but the truer statement is that I'd grown to hate Canada. I hated the Canadian sense of superiority, 
the idea that Canada offered the same opportunities as the U.S., only without the crime, without the chaos, without the social problems. It wasn't true. There were the same problems in both countries. If the U.S. was a freak show in an open-air market, then Canada's dirt lay hidden in a filing cabinet marked confidential. Canada kept secrets. More to the point, after my sister died, I believed secrets were being kept from me. For a long time, I was determined to keep moving. I suffered from an acute wonder lost. My wife and I traveled all over the country. In eight years, we had moved from Southeast Texas to Toronto, to California, to the Carolinas. I had an aunt who used to love saying to us, when are you gonna stop living like the gypsies and settle down? So what were the odds that me, of all people, when I finally made the decision to settle down, would choose to buy a home with a dead body on it. Deborah Key was known for her independence and for taking risks. On the night of Sunday, November 30th, 1997, the 35 year old woman was seated at the bar of Sticks and Stones, a local pool hall in Carborough, North Carolina. Seated at the end of the bar within Debbie's view was a young man in a leather jacket his hair tied back in a ponytail. The man was busy drawing nudie pictures in an artist's sketchbook. Prepubescent girls in spacesuits with huge cans. Sailor Moon with a hormonal imbalance. The young man was drinking a Diet Coke. Deborah Key was drinking too much. At some point, Deborah got up from the bar stool and started ragging on the young man for drawing such disgusting pictures. The man apologized for offending her. He asked if she'd like to join him for a drink. Not at the bar, they would move to a booth in the back. Shortly before closing time, the bartender saw the couple together in the corner. She was giving him a back massage. They were very flirtatious. The five foot six, 115 pound brunette was last seen at 2.30 a.m. in the parking lot of Sticks and Stones. Key and the young man were leaning up against her car, kissing. A few days later, the police found Deborah's unlocked car, still parked in the lot of Sticks and Stones. Her purse was resting on the passenger side seat. No one has seen her since. It took police six months to track down the young man with the ponytail. When they asked the young man, the former residents of the house, to come in for questioning, he said he would be at the police headquarters in the morning. By the time the morning came, his lawyer intervened and told him that he would not be available to answer any questions. The police got a search warrant for the young man's car but the lab results came back inconclusive. They found some blood-stained woman's underwear in the car, but they were never able to link it to the underwear of Deborah Key. The police were unsuccessful in trying to obtain a search warrant for the house. The car was easy since it was established the young man and his car were at the location where Deborah Key was last seen alive in the early morning of December 1st, 1997. The house was another matter. There was nothing to suggest that he and Key had traveled in the car all the way back to the house. The case dragged on for two years. The police had a lead suspect, they just didn't have a body, and their suspect wasn't talking. In December of 1999, our soon-to-be house was put on the market. Immediately, the investigation into Key's disappearance began to take a new life. Detectives believed that Key's body might be buried somewhere on the lot. In an effort to gain access to the property, police had agents pose as interested buyers to see if they could learn anything from viewing the interior of the house. They found the place in such a dilapidated state, investigators speculated that their suspect might be deliberately trashing the house in an effort to keep what was inside hidden. 
if the place looked like crap, then no one would ever want to buy it. <laughs> in the spring of 2000, the local police chief was making a routine pass in an unmarked car when she noticed that the heaps of garbage that were normally piled up in front of the yard, in the front yard, had suddenly been replaced with children's toys. Someone had actually bought this dump. A week later, the chief of police called my wife and asked to pay a visit. When the police arrived, uh, they assured us they wanted to get this over with just as quickly and smoothly as possible. But there were problems. They couldn't locate a cadaver dog. The, the one they wanted was from Florida, but he had suddenly been called away on business in Atlanta. It seemed that cadaver dogs was... It, it, <laughs> Sorry. It seemed the cadaver dog was overbooked. We'd have to wait two weeks before they could search the grounds for a body. But couldn't you just get another dog, I asked. Well, we could, but we want the best. This dog's the best. Why do we have to wait two weeks? The dog needs his rest. It's exhausting work. <laughs> I kid you not, they said that. <laughs> Before they left, they wanted to assure us we were in no danger. Deborah Key was most likely this guy's first kill. Police felt confident that the body wasn't buried anywhere in the house. If he did dispose of the body here, then it was probably in the backwoods someplace. In any case, they did ask us not to speak about the matter to anyone. Word might get out, and they didn't want to tip off their suspect. <clears throat> Just in case he got in his head to run. Or maybe come back and move the body, an officer added. Finally, they all got up and said, we'll see in two weeks. That first weekend, we stayed at the beach. Then we stayed at my mother-in-law's. When we had run out of favors, we came back home. Home. We always talked about how neat it would be to live in a haunted house. But this wasn't haunted. This was motherfucking creepy. There was the added benefit that my wife was by now seven months pregnant and looked like Mia Farrow in Rosemary's Baby. So began our two week freak out. We didn't sleep, not ever. I went to bed with a baseball bat, the telephone, the phone number of the police department, and a 15-pound mag light next to my bed. I'd wake up every night in a cold sweat. Was he coming back? Was there something he left behind? Was he in the house now? He probably still had the keys to it. He's probably standing in the living room right now with a pickaxe, just waiting for me to be foolish enough to come out after him. It didn't help that we had only lived in the house for a month. The place was scarier because you never knew where anything was. In the dark, I'd bump into walls and fumble for a light switch. I couldn't find anything. My daughter was sleeping in her room. Her bed was in the same spot where that lump rolled over and looked at me. One night, she came running out of her room. Mommy, Daddy, my room scares me. Oh, that's okay, Pumpkin. The whole house is scary. Didn't you know? We bought it from Leatherface. There was also the added spooky benefit of living in a deep, dark forest. Outside our bedroom window, we'd hear something moving that sounded like a 500-pound gorilla. I'd be cramming my heart back down my throat before I realized it was a herd of grazing deer. There were a lot of critters out there. Possums and coons, screech owls and badgers, and that something that made a sound so terrifying that my wife and I just labeled it the flying bush pig. We never did find out what it was. Somehow we survived. Two weeks passed. One morning, a caravan of vehicles came up our gravel driveway. We said hello to this again to the local detectives. Joining them that day for the day's proceedings were various patrol officers. The county sheriff's department a big fat agent from the State Bureau of Investigation, a team of forensic technicians, 
and the gang from Pee Wee's Septic Tank Service. Everyone gathered around and tried to look like they knew why they were there. Officers discreetly slurped on their Wendy's big gulps. From out of the back of a kennel in the police van stepped the star of the show. I was expecting a big, droopy bloodhound. I was surprised to find a svelte, handsome German shepherd. I never got his name. We were never formally introduced. The dog wrangler stepped forward. We'll start with the outer perimeter of the house. It's a good morning. The ground is wet, so we should be able to sniff through the clay. The wrangler pulled the dog up close and shoved a small black ball against his nose. Then he clipped the lead and let him run loose. The dog bolted off with officers and the wrangler in quick pursuit. While we were waiting to see what the dog would find, I insinuated myself into the conversation with the agents. My wife remained indoors. Earlier, we had pawned our daughter off on my mother-in-law. We didn't want her around this. My wife certainly wasn't setting foot outside. Unlike me, she had no fascination in seeing a corpse pulled out from under the dirt and the mud. Investigators were confident. They came and dressed for the event, decked out in black SWAT fatigues. The SBI agent wore checkered pants and an ugly tie. The mood was intense and full of expectation. Everyone was certain that after two and a half years, the mystery of Deborah Key's disappearance would finally be solved. The SBI agent spoke. We feel uh, pretty confident he buried her out in these woods somewhere. Or maybe in the septic tank. In our septic tank? Yeah, he might have chopped her up and dumped the pieces down the shaft. Pee-wee! You want to get that sewage pump started? The dog worked all morning. He sniffed the better part of the acre of our property. The dog came up with nothing. Their efforts were hampered by the soil. In this part of North Carolina, it's mostly made up of thick, hard clay. If anything were buried more than three feet deep, the dog would have a tough time picking up the scent. On the other hand, because the ground was so hard, it would be difficult for anyone to dig a grave deeper than three feet. I tried digging a garden in the stuff, and the effort practically killed me. My harvest consisted of one dwarf-sized pumpkin. Nothing grows in this stuff. Meanwhile, Pee-wee had managed to suck our septic to well dry. Everyone gathered around the well, opening and looking down with gruesome expectation. The tank was empty. There were no bones at the bottom. The mood turned from confident to confused. Uh, it's all right. We'd like to check the inside of the house. It was the FBI guy. I explained that we had gutted the place. There'd be no trace evidence. Everything was gone. The brown stained flooring, the clumps of hair from the bathroom traps. You didn't keep any of it, did you? <laughs> sure, it's in the medicine cabinet next to my collection of human excrement. As confusion turned to desperation, the recovery party agreed it was time to take the dog under the house. I opened the crawl space door, told everyone to mine the five foot ceiling. The wrangler did his little black ball trick and in went the dog. What's in that ball anyway, I asked. Rotting flesh. <laughs> I'm just kidding you. We don't use real corpses. Funny, yeah, that's some joke. I was getting bored. Three hours and these loafers were still at my house. Then finally the dog did something. At the back of the crawl space between two central supports, we all watched as the dog paced back and forth and began scratching on the red dirt floor. What's he doing? He's lighted on something. What's that mean? It means he's found something. It was scary. The dog kept pacing and scratching. I looked over my shoulder and there was a police officer with two shovels. Everyone began to dig. I couldn't believe it. A dead body was buried under my house? It's been under this house alone? 
I'd come under here to repair the insulation, to fix the telephone wiring. The digging took a lot of effort. The space was too small to raise the shovel over your head. You, you couldn't get a full arc. It was hot, humid. We kept running out of breath. The clay was hard as rock. You couldn't really dig. You had to chip away at the layers. We got two feet down. Finally, after 45 minutes, we decided to stop. There wasn't anything here. We didn't find Debbie Key. As things wound down, the police told us not to worry. The good news was there wasn't a body buried on our property. The bad news was Deborah Key was still a missing person. Everyone looked discouraged. The way you look after the first 10 minutes, you know that the Super Bowl is going to be a blowout. Detectives took the dog's reaction into consideration and formed a theory. After she died, Deborah Key's body was probably stored under the house for a brief period of time. Her killer took the time to plan how he would finally dispose of the body. Deborah Key was not buried here. If agents couldn't dig through the clay, then their suspects certainly couldn't either. The police also wanted us to know that Deborah Key probably had died, hadn't died in the house. Police believed she was killed earlier in the killer's car. After that day with the cadaver dog, I began to have terrible nightmares. I dreamed about rotting corpses all the time. I couldn't stop thinking about it. Around the same time, my daughter was doing some dreaming of her own. One day I caught her walking down the hall muttering to herself, no, no way, definitely don't wanna have that dream again, oh boy. I don't want to have that dream where mom and dad turn into skeletons. She later confided to me that she had a recurring dream where she was strapped in her car seat and the car was moving down the road, but no one was driving. I know just how she feels. Some of my dreams get downright bizarre. There was one where I was at a party